Good morning. Yesterday, as I saw the outstanding group of servants cleaning up outside, I thought of the words of that old familiar hymn, Are You Raking the Leaves of the Kingdom, Brother? <laughs> or, Bringing in the Leaves, We Shall Come Rejoicing, Bringing in the Leaves. In fact, I was so impressed, I thought I should stop everybody and just tell the group I feel a sermon coming along. But I was still being taught how to use a rake, and so I wanted to stay with it. With Jesus in a boat and a crowd on the shore, he presented word pictures. We call them parables from two Greek words put together that mean casting alongside of so that by showing us something visible on the earthly plane, we could imagine something that is beyond our sight and take it to heart. There's a place just a mile away from Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee that could have been the very spot where these events took place. In fact, it's called the Cove of the Sower for that very reason. It's a natural amphitheater, as you can see the circular area, and then almost like rows of seats going up higher, so that one can visit there today and stand down by the water and speak, and those even at the very top of the hill can hear them distinctly. Jesus may have used a spot like this to talk about the kingdom of God. What's it like? How can we imagine it? How can we describe it so we can paint in someone else's mind what Jesus sees as God at work, God on the throne, His reign, His dominion. And even though the phrase is used over and over again, kingdom of heaven, it's very much about that kingdom expressing itself on earth that would be established in the church on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So though it has to do with realities in that realm, those principles are carried out every day. And I couldn't help but notice how often Jesus used agriculture, farming, the idea that something that is alive, that has what it needs, is going to grow and thrive and develop and reproduce. And again and again, Jesus pointed to seeds and fields and wheat or a mustard seed or even talking about fish brought in by a great net. God made this world so that living things grow and thrive and develop and then further themselves so that there are more and more that come according to their kind. And I couldn't help but think yesterday, because this is the way preachers are, as I saw all those leaves on the ground, what could come from a single seed a mighty tree and all of its branches and all that we were raking and bagging because of what God could do with something little that was put in the ground and then it had water and nourishment and sunshine. So it is with the church. We are the living, breathing body of Jesus Christ. And so when we see in Acts and throughout the rest of the New Testament, this multiplying we talked about last time, we realize that God intended for seed of His Word to take root in our hearts, and then we treasure it, we receive it, we develop our faith because of it, and the next thing you know, there's wheat, there's a tree, there's a mustard plant. There's something that comes about so that others recognize God is at work. Several of you responded last week to our math puzzle, 
are just smarter than a fifth grader. And you counted up the girls and the cats and the backpacks. That principle now we see applied in the stories Jesus told. So simple that a child could grasp the thrust of it. And yet so profound that no matter how old we are or how long we consider it, we continue to be blessed by it. I was impressed by the nature of growing things in New York City years ago when going to the top of tower number two in the World Trade Center and in that city of glass and steel and concrete, there in a little crack in the top of that building, I saw a weed. Yes, a weed. And there was just enough dirt. And somehow the wind had carried. That's the way God made the world. And perhaps he designed it so that we could look at the things that we see around us. Like leaves and yes, even weeds and recognize how God can take our lives. We are the soil. It's called the parable of the sower, but also the parable of the soils because the first impetus of it has to do with the responses that people make toward it. So you might imagine Jesus here on the Sea of Galilee looking toward that cove, and then people like those trees on the beach and perhaps any number of them. Some have groups have gone there with six or 7,000 people and there's room for the whole crowd. But today I want you and me to put ourselves as if we're in that area and we're listening and Jesus is in the boat and it wouldn't have been as far out as that one. And those two in the front, that's not anybody I know. But I think this picture captures the idea that he that has ears to hear, let him hear. First of all, you have the farmer, probably with a bag and with seed that he would take in his hand. Lacking modern equipment, he would have thrown it far and wide. He knew that not all of it would land in a good spot, but some of it would who is the sower? Sometimes we speak about ourselves, as I said a moment ago, about sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother. But first of all, Jesus is the sower. And what he's doing with those who are on the land is he's tossing out eternal truths that apply to everyday life so that the hearers will take from that and consider which of these might I be. There's along the path, and the seed can't even penetrate, and the birds come and eat it up. And Jesus would say in his application a few verses down that there are those that won't even let the message get below the surface and Satan, like those birds, will come. And look how Jesus used what they would have witnessed on an ordinary day. So they'd see the birds eating the seed. They think, that's what Satan could do to me. If I don't take the message in, if I don't open up to it, it's not going to stay there forever. And then he talked about thin soil that might have rocks underneath and no place for the roots to go down very deep. And he said, there are those that hear the good news and they're excited and they're thrilled and they're up and going. And then persecution, affliction, difficulties come. And it's like the hot sun and because they're not sinking deep into the soil, there's not enough to sustain them, and they wither and they die. And then there was that soil that was so full of other stuff, thorns and weeds, that the new plants couldn't really find a spot of their own. And the big husky plants that you wouldn't want took all the sunshine, all the nutrients, and all the water. How many of us have plants just like that in our yard? 
No room for it. Some other things had to be cleared out first, uh, removed, dug up, taken away. And then remarkably, that fertile soil with no barrier, and the seed gets past the surface, the rocks aren't there underneath to stop it from going all the way in, and there's not other stuff blocking it out. And Jesus talked about a seed producing 30 times itself, or 60, or 100. Again, we sometimes apply this story to what we do as we seek to win others to Christ. And we have this opportunity coming up this Saturday morning, don't we? From 10 o'clock to noon, we're going to start at Knox Park, and we're going to go to the homes that have received our magazine, House to House, Heart to Heart. And we're going to say, we're the people that have been sending you this. Have you received it? Have you had a chance to look at it? What do you think about it? And we're going to go something like that sower. But before we get to that point, we must be the soil. Because you see, the effort to reproduce comes as a result of taking the Word of God in. And that's when we grow. That's how we become like Christ. And that's how we turn from receivers to spreaders. From those that first have the seed given to us by Jesus through others, through the Word of God, to those that look for opportunities to let someone else be blessed in the same way. In the middle of this passage, look at verses 10 through 17. Why did Jesus teach in this way? Well, some of the responses we make are those we've already noted. A youngster can see the picture and say, oh, I'm learning. And we could apply that with our children or little ones and say, let's plant a garden. Let's make something grow and let's have a visual representation of what God can do in our lives. The parables clarify somewhat complicated matters, bring them down to earth. They continue to challenge us and instruct us no matter how long we've been in Christ. But in this passage, Jesus' stories also had a way of enabling those who had ears to hear, who wanted the message, to be able to grasp it and understand it and comprehend it. But those that resisted, that had closed themselves off, in them the prophecy of Isaiah from chapter 6 would be fulfilled. Matthew writes by inspiration. There would be those that would see but never perceive, those that would hear but would never make sense of what they were hearing. If they would, they would turn and I would heal them. Eyes to see, ears to hear. My precious mom passed away at the age of 91. She had hearing aids. She was thankful for them. As much as we grieved over her death, as much as we rejoiced in the promise on the other side, absent from the body at home with the Lord, there was an additional benefit that came out of all that. My brother's father-in-law discovered that he could wear my mother's hearing aids. They fit. They sounded good. It worked. And I remember the big grin on his face all the way across. He said, I have Mary's hearing aids. And I couldn't help but think how my mom loved the Word of God. She would take every class she could. She would take extensive copious notes. She would teach ladies groups occasionally, not regularly. 
And my mom had ears to hear, and, and you wish you could take the hearing aid, so to speak. You just want everybody to, to be attuned to the wonderful things of God. And then a very dear family that's been worshiping with us here for some time. He came up to me a few weeks ago and he said, I have something I want to share with the church, anyone that might like to have these. You know what's in here? Replacement batteries for hearing aids. A whole case of them. And these will be available through the church office. And I thought, I know when I'm going to introduce these batteries to the church. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. And then go down to verses 34 and 35 for a moment. There you read that Jesus always used parables, and he didn't speak without them. And there's a quotation from Psalm 78. If you want to look there, verses 1 and 2, the beginning of Psalm 78, I'll open my mouth in these sayings, these riddles, these figures of speech, if you will. And Matthew, with the Spirit of God leading him as he writes, he always sees something Jesus does, and he says, oh, that fits with this that had been spoken long ago. There are things that we can teach directly. Here are the facts. Here are the truths. Here's what the Scriptures say. And that's good. But a picture is worth a thousand words, and pictures stay with us as they did with Jesus. And you and I will never forget the parable of the soils and the sower. We can't because we've seen it. And the more we see it, the more we want to enact it in our lives. All these things to the crowd in parables. He said nothing to them without a parable. And let me be sure to add that in Matthew 13, we certainly don't have all the parables Jesus told. You know that already. There are so many others. We think about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost or prodigal son in Luke 15. I think about Mark 4. There's a parable in Mark 4 that we don't read in the other Gospels about a seed that was planted, and then whether the owner stayed awake or whether he slept, the seed kept growing, growing, and growing because the life was in the seed and the Greek word is used from which we get automatic. The seed grew of itself automatically. That there's power in the seed that develops over time. But in Matthew 13, we have what we sometimes call the kingdom parables. And there are eight here, if we include the last one I'm going to mention as a parable with the others. This second story reminds us that it's not only God's Word that's being planted in this world. There is an enemy, Satan, the devil, the snake, the dragon, the ravenous lion. And he is out to work through his farmers to go to the very same land where healthy wheat can be planted or has been and put these tares or darnel. These are plants that look just like wheat until the time comes close to maturity and there's no grain in them. Well, what do we do? Do we, do we pull up the weeds? No, you'll damage the wheat. Wait for the harvest. And the harvesters will bring them all in and separate them. The wheat into barns and the weeds unquenchable fire. That's what's going to happen at the judgment. There are in this world genuine disciples of Jesus Christ and there, there are weeds. And you and I don't always know, just like they wouldn't have known in the early stages looking at the field, but God knows. And at the day of the harvest, the angels will be the reapers. And there's that unquenchable fire that outer darkness with the weeping and gnashing of teeth. And you and I are sitting on the shore, and what are we saying? I'm going to be the wheat. First story, I'm going to be the good soil. I believe I can change if I'm not. Gets rid of some rocks and some thorns. Soften this hard exterior. I want to be the good soil. Now, I want to be the wheat. How am I going to know I'm the wheat? Because... 
the fruit is recognizable. And Jesus taught this over and over again. The weeds don't have the fruit that you see in the wheat. Mustard seed between the fingers and a mustard tree, they would grow 10 feet tall, perhaps 15 feet, large enough for the birds of the air to find some shelter there. A little bit of leaven or yeast mixed in three measures. I learned in my study this week that that amount of food would provide a meal for a hundred people. How much of a seed does it take for there to be a plant? How much faith, as Jesus spoke of faith the size of a mustard seed, if it's genuine, if it's real, it will not stay where it is. The point is not simply if you have a little faith that's sufficient. If you have a little faith and it's real, it's going to blossom. Sometimes in the New Testament, leaven or yeast is used in a negative way. 1 Corinthians 5, there was sin in the camp. A man living immorally and a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough in a bad way. Of course, the Jews were taught not to have any leaven in their homes when they observed the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But here it seems clear that Jesus is the influence of leaven in a positive manner to talk about the kingdom of God. You may look at, 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 at what you see and it's not that much. It's a, it's a tiny seed. It's a little bit of yeast. But, but depending on what you do with it, Put that seed in the ground. Take that leaven and work it through the dough. The buried treasure reminds us that those who are effective in the kingdom of God have bought in. We are not spectators. We are not window shoppers. We are those who have said this relationship with God is so precious to me I'm putting myself into it. This pearl, oh I've had all my other little pearls but I found something in Jesus Christ. I'm willing to let the others Go. It's buy-in. Jesus used merchandising. He used selling. He used shopping. He used shopping. To help who, who love the kingdom of heaven and recognize its worth. Oh, that net. I learned that the nets they use and some use today though I'm not an accomplished fisherman by any means, would have floats to keep the top of it on the water and have weights to keep the rest of it on the bottom. And as the fish would come through, the net would be open and it would catch them. Good fish or bad? Yes, that's right. Good fish and bad. And not too different from Jesus talking about the wheat and the weeds. The net would draw all types. But there's a day of separation coming, as he noted before. This last one is at least a, if not an eighth parable. Jesus said, do you understand all these things? I'm surprised the disciples said, yes, we do. Because you and I know that as we are growing in Christ, we don't ever understand it all. We keep striving and stretching and learning and sharing. But then Jesus said, every scribe who has been trained, this is the word disciple, every scribe who has been made a disciple is like a householder 
who has stored items that he can bring out as his family needs them. Some old and some new. And perhaps Jesus is talking about those who have already known the Old Testament or covenant. And now as they're hearing Jesus, they're recognizing the treasure of the new. And just like one who provides for his family would store up what they needed so that in a time of concern, he could go back to that storage area and bring out additional food and supplies. So one who knew the old and the new could take from it and present it to others so that they might enjoy that provision as well. Where are you? You're sitting there on the beach. Who are you listening to? Jesus from a boat. What are you doing with the seed he's scattering across this room? What are you doing? as you think about the principles he described, the wheat and the tares or weeds, the mustard seed, the leaven, the buried treasure, the pearl of great value, we're left with a decision, as we are every time we hear the Word of God. And so we offer His invitation you know, in Acts chapter 2, the people there on the day of Pentecost had come from different lands. But what happened? They heard the things of God in their own languages by that great miracle. Some 3,000 repented of sins. They were baptized. They were added. They became Christians. They were saved that day. How many others were there? We don't know that had ears that didn't hear or eyes that didn't see. That's not going to be you. You're going to respond, not necessarily today in a public way, but in your heart and in your life and in your decisions, you're going to show what God is doing with that seed in your heart. If you do have questions about being baptized, if you'd like to talk more about following Christ and becoming a Christian, you have concerns and needs for prayer, we're going to sing a song to encourage you. Shall we stand?